Thank you all for being here at Kirby Woods, uh, ready to hear a word from the Lord, I hope and I trust. So we've concluded our misunderstood sermon series last week, which means that it's time to start something new. And I was hoping for a series that would take us from now until December, where we can then pause and enjoy the Christmas season. So with our series so far that we've been going through as a church, I've tried my best to apply God's word to where our church is at the time. Uh, In my first series, These Four Walls, I hope you saw that was me as a new pastor trying to show you sort of where I think we should head. Uh, We looked at the wilderness series in the book of Numbers and in many ways acknowledging that Kirby Woods has sort of been in a phase mirroring in some ways that, but obviously with God's hand of blessing uh, in moments of grace throughout. And then now it seems to me that sort of that time to look back and diagnose and think about how things are the way they are. To me, I feel that slipping away as a time that should be passed. Uh, It's time, in my opinion, to look forward. Uh, It's time to clearly state and restate who we are and what we intend to be and what we intend to do. And I can think of no better book in the Bible for a church ready to get to work than the book of Acts. I can think of no greater book in the Bible for a church looking to clearly define what the next 10 years of ministry is going to look like than the book of Acts. Between now and December, we'll be studying at least the Jerusalem period in the book of Acts, focusing on the boldness and power of the early church. The truth is, I did not want to preach this series. I tried not to, actually. I now understand what Paul meant when he said the Holy Spirit prevented me from going. Uh, And I didn't want to just do something that I've done before. The honesty is I've preached this book about three years ago. Okay, so it's not something that I was super, I wanted to go reinvent and do something again that I've already done. I didn't want to do that. It's not just because it's a favorite book of mine. It is actually a favorite book of mine. I wanted to make sure that if we were going to do this book that it was absolutely what God wanted us to do and not just something that I've done before. And so I I tried probably 10 other books to make it work and and looked at it, mapped it out, planned it out, and got zero confirmation from God that those books were where we should be. And so I tell you that just to, to know as we approach this series, I think this is exactly where God wants us right now. I feel complete confidence that this is the right study for us as Kirby Woods. And so, uh, to make a connection to the beginning of this awesome book, I can say, I wish I was more of an American history scholar. Uh, Do we have any U.S. history buffs in the room? Anybody would say that's me? Wow. I thought I'd get one. Okay. Um, So, it's something I enjoy. I enjoy U.S. history, and uh, I, I can't call myself a buff I would like to just be buff, honestly, but I can't call myself a buff in anything. How does one become a buff? Anyway, the founding of our nation and that entire era of transition from colonies to country, it's such an interesting historical moment for me. And and here's what I do know. A handful of initial founders went through a lot of turmoil, fought a war, wrote a constitution, and created a nation that they believed was the best the world had ever seen. And at some point, they had to take that thing and hand it off to the next generation. Can you imagine being the second generation after the founding fathers? Handed a new country that was fought for and bled over a constitution that was and is an incredible breakthrough document in history, knowing that it's your job to keep this thing going and keep it afloat. It's in your hands to keep the flame burning. Now imagine how the disciples felt when Jesus instituted the church, the kingdom of God, and handed it to them. Jesus came and started a kingdom. He bled for it, he died for it. He gave the founding principles in his teachings while on the earth, and then he hands it off to his disciples and says, take this. Yes, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, but this is yours to do now. Imagine that feeling. 
That's where the book of Acts begins. Today's message really is an introductory message. I hope you like introductions to series, because that's what we're going to have today. And I've entitled this message, The Continuing Work of Christ, because that's exactly what the apostles are doing all through the book of Acts, continuing the work of Christ. So before we look at God's word, one more time, please pray with me. Lord, would you help us today to see truth so clearly that we can't look away from it, that, Lord, we are just... Uh, in awe of who you are and what you've done. God, that we're moved in our soul to do something about what we hear today. Lord, I pray for one here today that needs to have a a solid confirmation in their spirit. Uh, Lord, for someone who needs to know uh, that you are the only way, that the tomb is empty and that you are alive and that you would cement that into our hearts today, even in an introductory message to a new book study. God, would you do it in Jesus' name, amen. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, verse 1. As you do, let me give you some fast facts. You have to do it at the beginning of a new series. It's part of it. Uh, So the author of the book of Acts is Luke, the same Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke and also is seen and, well, written about traveling around with Paul later in the book of Acts and mentioned at the end of some of Paul's letters when he says, hey, tell everybody we're good. Uh, Luke is called a physician one time in the Bible, leading people to believe he has had medical training. Certainly his Greek is very good. Uh, Perhaps he practiced, we don't know, but Luke was likely a Gentile, making him the only confirmed non-Jewish author in all of Scripture. Though Luke is often referred to as Dr. Luke, we would be more apt to describe him, I think, as historian Luke or journalist Luke. He does not uh, write his gospel, or even acts, all of it, as an eyewitness, but rather as a journalist who has spoken to and interviewed other eyewitnesses. So listen to the way that Luke begins his gospel, not acts, his gospel. It says this, "...inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So clearly we see a methodology that he's going to use to compile an orderly account from eyewitnesses to grant certainty to the reader. And that's great news because that's exactly what I need. Maybe that's exactly what you need, an orderly account from eyewitnesses that gives me certainty. That's why I'm reading it. And originally, Luke wrote his gospel first, and then he writes Acts second, which is like a sequel. In fact, before the Bible was compiled into one single book like we have today, maybe between a leather-bound binding, Luke and Acts circulated around as a two-volume set. They were always connected together. Acts is intended to be immediately read and written after the Gospel of Luke. So, this is a 28-chapter book. It covers about 30 years of church history from the ascension of Jesus until about the year 60 to 62 AD. Most conservative scholars date Acts being between 60 and 62 because it does not mention the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70. It does not mention the death of Paul in 68 or the persecution of Nero in 64 after the fire of Rome. So 62 is a pretty safe date for the composition of Acts. So now let's put our attention on Acts 1, 1 through 5. This is called Luke's prologue. This is Luke's beginning to this book, this narrative. It says this, in the first book, O Theophilus, that's his gospel, in the first one, and by the way, real quick, Theophilus, I'm probably going to say what that is, that could either be a person's name, literally named Theophilus, or it could be a generic term for someone who loves God, theos and uh, phila. So you could put those two things together, say love God. Uh, Most scholars think it's probably a person who financed 
this work to be done. This was his uh, financier of the historical work. So I'll probably take that position that there's a guy out there named Theophilus. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So I want to give you three directives from this book. Three things we see presented in these initial five verses that Uh, are true of the apostles, but I think are true for us today as well, since we are the extension of the church that the apostles built. So first we see that we are to, number one, expand what Jesus started. i got three E's for you. Expand what Jesus started. And before I get too far, let me just say, I don't mean improve. I don't mean change. I mean expand upon Look back at verse 1. Luke writes, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus... What word do you have next? Began. Began to do and teach. You know, sometimes reading the Bible, that little single word pops out at you. It's different than you've ever read it before. And that happened to me when I saw that word began this week. Luke says that his 24-chapter gospel was what Jesus began to do. Now, this is the Greek word arko, which means to commence, to be first, the beginning of something. So in Luke's mind, everything that Jesus did while he was on the earth was the beginning of what he would do and teach. And this is very important because it will affect the way that we view what the apostles did in the book of Acts, and it will affect the way you view church today. So we're we're not doing something different than what Jesus started. You know that, right? In our church, we're we're not out here doing something different than what Jesus started. We, the church, are not rogue agents who get to lick our finger and see where the wind blows and decide what our church is supposed to be based on the trends. No, if, if uh, if Jesus began the church and then handed it over, then we are continuing the work that Jesus started. We build on his foundation. We expand the same kingdom that he inaugurated. You see, Jesus came and laid the foundation for a kingdom that will one day overtake this earth. He had a herald in John the Baptist to announce his coming. His baptism was the coronation ceremony. The cross defeated the enemy of sin. The resurrection defeated the enemy of death. And he ascended into the heavenly kingdom, charged his disciples with preparing and building this earthly kingdom. And one day he's going to come back and merge the two kingdoms together. Heaven and earth come together. And then at that time, he will deal the final death blow to Satan. As Humble as Jesus' life was on the earth, having remained in the same geographic area his whole life, having poured mostly into 12 ordinary men, he actually came saying, repent for the kingdom is at hand. The gospels were just the start of a kingdom. In the book of Acts, we see Jesus hand over the reins to the disciples, who hand over the reins to their disciples, who hand over the reins to their disciples, who hand over the reins. We could do this a thousand more times. And guess what? Now it's in your hands, the reins of the kingdom. Through Kirby Woods Baptist Church, we join together to expand the same kingdom that Jesus started building 2,000 years ago. That's pretty humbling, isn't it? to think about our role in God's plan. So Luke, in his prologue, looks back. He says, the Gospels were what Jesus began, and we know that Acts is the continuation of that work. The work is not complete until Christ returns, which means you and we are a vital part of the kingdom of God. That's the first directive to the apostles and to us to expand what Jesus started. Number two, I I want you to see 
that their goal was to emphasize the resurrection. To emphasize the resurrection. Here's what I want you to see all throughout this book, and especially in the Jerusalem period, that though the apostles do preach and teach on various topics, there is one that rises above the rest. Though Peter, James, John, Stephen, Philip, Paul, and many others do teach on a variety of biblical themes and topics, the resurrection is the major theme, the primary theme. So look at how Luke phrases the next part of his prologue in verse 3 of Acts 1. He says, he presented himself alive to them after suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. This verse reminds the reader that Jesus, after his resurrection, made appearances to people. He made appearances to people. His resurrected body was walking around the area for 40 days. Now, I want you to think about that because it's, it's kind of easy to think that as soon as Jesus was resurrected, walked out of the tomb, that he was just immediately lifted into heaven, or at least maybe a day or two later. But we are told, no, the post-resurrected Jesus actually hung around for 40 days and made appearances in the flesh. What did he do? Well, I wish I, wish I had more, but what Luke tells us is that he spoke about the kingdom of God. This is one of those times when, man, you wish you could just get Luke in, in a corner room and just, hey, you can tell me. What was it about? You know, tell me what he really said. And we just, we don't have it in detail, but all we know is that Jesus taught on the kingdom up until the moment that he was lifted into heaven. Now, I believe Luke is setting up the preaching portions of Acts, which are going to be dominated by the resurrection. He's setting them up with these little journalistic phrases. Verse 3 is so packed. It's like a lawyer wrote that thing. Every single word is chosen with extreme meaning. Look at this. I want to go word by word in verse 3. If, if you're skeptical, listen to this. It says, Jesus presented himself. So what does that mean? He was not hiding. He was not seeking cover. He was not skirting around in the dark of night trying not to be seen. He made himself known. He presented himself. How did he present himself? Next word says, alive. Well, this was not a spiritual presentation. This was not a ghostly presentation. This was not a hologram, a hallucination this was not a dead body, open casket funeral. No, Jesus presented himself alive. You could high five him. You could hug him. You could watch him eat a fish taco. He was very much alive. When did he present himself? It tells us after his suffering. This is just to cover the base that all this was after the crucifixion. This is not explained by people thinking they saw Jesus. It was really after, you know, they said they thought they saw him after he rose from the dead, but really their memory was foggy. They saw him on, you know, the Thursday before. They were confused. No, Luke says this was after his suffering. The next phrase says that he did this, I love this phrase, by many proofs, by many proofs. That's the Greek tekmerion, the word for proof. The definition of that Greek word is that which causes something to be verified or confirmed. Now, I can't tell you exactly what that would entail, but Jesus did something in these appearances to cause Luke to use the word proof. So maybe he let them examine his body. Hey, come check this out. You know, touch here, touch here. We know Thomas got to. I don't know what he did, but to them, it was verified. My mind is made up. It has been proven to me. That's exactly what that word means, confirmation. They didn't go away thinking, you know, I, I think I saw a resurrected Christ, but the lighting wasn't very good. And, you know, it was like Bigfoot. It was like one of those films where he kind of just walks by and, you know, so the kind of grainy. I couldn't really tell what I was looking at. No, this was a, they walked away 100% sure they had seen the risen Christ. And we said earlier this period lasts a period of 40 days this went on. So why does Luke use such clarity of language? It's because this event the bodily resurrection of Jesus is the defining moment of all human history 
and the climax of the gospel that we believe. The early church would have to hang their hat on the fact that Jesus was truly alive. The apostles, when they were thrown in jail and beaten and hung and stabbed and crucified, would need to know deep in their soul that they were living and preaching and dying for a confirmed fact of history, that Christ was and is risen. Listen to these sermon excerpts from the first five chapters of Acts to illustrate their reliance. These are just sermon clips from the first five chapters. Acts 2.32, this Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses. Acts 3.14, you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. Acts 4.10, let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. In Acts 5.30, the God of our fathers raised Jesus whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. The feature of New Testament Christianity, New Testament preaching, is a dedication to include the resurrection of Jesus as a fact that must be dealt with. The reality is, if you don't have a resurrection, you do not have a gospel. Now, I want you to notice the unique feature of the church. The way that they frame this is a little different than we frame it today. They frame it primarily with eyewitness testimony. You see, today we might appeal, and we do, to the reliability of Scripture, to the uh, changed lives of Jesus' half-brothers or the Apostle Paul who didn't believe and then he did believe, and then something changed and all of a sudden he's preaching. We might use those kind of, of proofs to detail why we believe it. We might appeal to the fact that a body was never found. We might say, isn't it interesting if the Jews and the Romans wanted to end this thing, all they had to do was go get the dead body and make a parade through town. As gruesome as that sounds, they could have killed Christianity in a day if they produced the body. We, we do those things. I want you to know they, in this time, were appealing primarily to the people who were alive at the time of writing who saw Jesus and spoke to him after the resurrection. This is plainly evident in one of my favorite passages of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to see how Paul defines the gospel and leans on the same appearances of Jesus that Luke describes in Acts 1. Can we do a little apologetics? Y'all like some apologetics once in a while? Okay, that's all I needed. Thank you. Something you may or may not know about uh, liberal skeptical scholarship called critical scholarship. Uh, they don't believe that all the books of the Bible were written by the authors whose names are on the books, okay? So if you're conservative like me, uh, you believe Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, Luke wrote Luke, go down the list. You believe it, it's true. Uh, but critical scholarship does not believe that the Gospels or the book of Acts were written by who they say they are. They want to date them late into the 200s or the 300s. Um, and so, the, obviously, the, the intent is to discredit the, the miraculous events contained in those books. But here's something else you may not know. Even the most liberal, skeptical Bible scholars will admit to you that the historical Apostle Paul really existed and really wrote seven of the letters that have his name on it. So, hardened liberals will give you seven of Paul's letters, and they say, yeah, we think there was a Paul, and it was that Paul, and he wrote these seven. These are called the undisputed letters of Paul. Now, again, I don't dispute any of them. I want you to know that. I dispute zero of them. But if we're talking about apologetics, you need to know that there are seven undisputed. Everybody grants you these seven. And for whatever reason, one of the letters that even the most hardened liberal scholar will grant you is 1 Corinthians. They believe Paul really wrote 1 Corinthians. Maybe it's because he's so specific and angry in that letter that it sounds realistic. I don't know. When was 1 Corinthians written by Paul? About 55 AD, 20 years after the resurrection, ballpark. And who was alive 20 years after Jesus' resurrection? 
just about everybody. Just about everybody who was there when he was raised from the dead was still living in the 50s AD. I want to read to you what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, in 55 AD, when most all of the eyewitnesses were still alive. And remind you, everyone agrees Paul was a real person who really wrote this. Says this, Paul writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. What is Paul's basis for believing the resurrection? the appearances. He's daring the audience. Go ask them. They're still alive. They saw it. This idea of a resurrected Christ is not something cooked up centuries later to create a Messiah religion. Paul was saying this in 55 AD. And I can actually do you one better than that. Something I learned recently. I I got a, it's in my system and I've been waiting for the time to tell it. So this is it. I recently listened to a podcast with perhaps the leading scholar on the resurrection of Christ. His name is Dr. Gary Habermas. Gary Habermas says that though 1 Corinthians is dated 55 AD, that portion of 1 Corinthians 15 that we read just now actually contains an early Christian creed that we might call it a hymn, we might call it a poem. But a creed is a memorizable short statement to help you internalize your theology to remember important text. So the early church was either reciting or singing that list of what the gospel is and who he appeared to. And Habermas says that this creed in chapter 15 can accurately be dated to the 30s AD, within three years of the resurrection of Christ. Now, why does that matter? To show The resurrection of Jesus Christ was a primary feature of New Testament Christian preaching from the very beginning. From day one, they focused on, emphasized, maximized the resurrected Christ from day one. This was not something that they decided in a dark, smoke-filled room hundreds of years later to add to the moral teachings of a nice guy. While the eyewitnesses were still alive and while the heat was on, they preached a resurrected Christ. So we have seen that the feature of the book of Acts would be to expand upon what Jesus started, to emphasize his resurrection, and lastly, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. To be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So look with me at verses 4 and 5 to see the final part of Luke's prologue says this, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, many have suggested through church history that a better name for this book would not be the Acts of the Apostles, but rather the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And I think we should start a petition and see what we can do. I'm just kidding. But it is a clear and present theme that the Holy Spirit is quite active and defined in the book of Acts. While the Holy Spirit certainly existed before the book of Acts, one has to admit he gets more attention line for line from Luke than most all previous books of the Bible combined. To read the book of Acts apart from a dominant understanding and presence of the Holy Spirit would to miss out on the entire theme of this book. As verse 4 begins, Luke is progressing the prologue by stating that the resurrected Christ ordered his disciples not to depart from Jerusalem. Now, the Greek construction literally reads, stop departing. Stop departing Jerusalem, as to indicate they were kind of bouncing in and out. Maybe they're going to Bethany every night. Maybe they're going to Bethlehem and in and out and stopping up to see Ma in, in Galilee. But Jesus says, stop it. Stay here in Jerusalem, and, and then he 
says, again, I'm sending the promise in Luke 24. He says, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So clearly the promise of power is the Holy Spirit's promise. And you see a quotation even there where Luke blends together something said by John the Baptist with something said by Jesus in the moment where uh, with, with Jesus' own promise of the Holy Spirit and John saying, I baptize with water for repentance, but Jesus is coming to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now, with regard to the Holy Spirit, the Bible does, not, uh, does indicate that believers of all times have had access to the Holy Spirit, okay? So Holy Spirit did not just pop onto the scene in the book of Acts. He was not on the bench in heaven waiting for the book of Acts to get in the game. That's not true. However, I think it's pretty undeniable that something changed at Pentecost and afterward with respect to the availability and manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I believe the, the Holy Spirit is connected to the new covenant. And, and there is some difference between the Holy Spirit's activity in the Old Testament versus the new. So the, the Spirit is a significant part of the church, a significant part of the church, a significant part even of the modern church as well, not just that's for them, but for us as well. The little tagline on this series that I've given is boldness and power, boldness and power. And I want you to know the source of Christian boldness and power in the book of Acts is unmistakably the Holy Spirit coming from the Spirit of Jesus. This is so basic and so vital at the same time to hear this. The church's power, what we have to do, the job we need to do, comes from the Holy Spirit working in and through us. You know, when I was younger, one thing that scared me about leading a church was that you can be a spirit-filled church and not necessarily grow or have the explosive success that you see in the book of Acts. But as I've gotten more seasoned and I've seen some more things, I've realized that it's a far more scary prospect for a church to experience growth and explosive success apart from a work of the Holy Spirit. At some point in ministry, you realize that a church can be run like a machine, treated like a business, and led by a dynamic CEO, and have all the outward signs of success. But what does it profit a church if it has a full auditorium but the Spirit of God doesn't show up? You can be bold without the Holy Spirit, and you can have power in this life without the Holy Spirit. Lost people do it all the time. But I would submit to you that it's a dry boldness. It is a dry power. Lost people don't stand up and preach in the Spirit like Peter did in Acts 2, having the crowd respond, saying, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? That's a work of the Holy Spirit. Lost people don't pray in the Spirit like they did in Acts 4.31, where it says the ground beneath their feet was literally shaken. Only the Spirit of God could make people after being severely and publicly beaten in Acts 5.41, say that they were rejoicing, that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. That's spirit-filled boldness and power. To speak the gospel boldly, to pray with power, to be unashamed and unafraid to suffer dishonor for the name, to love and take care of each other and the fellowship as they did in Acts 4.32 where they were of one heart and one soul and sold their goods to help the poor among them. That's a successful church. That's a spirit-filled church. That's the kind of church that Jesus would have us to be, Kirby Woods. So if we look at the outline of Luke's prologue again, we see that our charge is the same as the apostles, to expand upon what Jesus started, to emphasize the resurrection in the gospel, and to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. That is a New Testament church battle plan. Now, just for kicks, I like to do this sometimes. What if we took what we were supposed to do and reversed it and read it backwards on what we're not supposed to do? Sometimes I like to hear what I'm not supposed to do, and that just helps my brain better. Maybe, maybe that's how you were raised or the way you think. What would it look like if we did the exact opposite of this? You would create your own church and seek to build whatever you wanted 
rather than building on the foundation of Jesus Christ, you would have it your way. You would thank Jesus for starting things in motion, give lip service to him, but quickly forget the founder and run things your own way. You would adopt a different primary message than the gospel. You would maximize on something other than the resurrection, things like inspiration or social issues or psychology or the headlines of the day or whatever would draw a non-threatening, non-specific, non-controversial crowd. And you do everything in your flesh and never take grieving the Holy Spirit into account with your actions. You would do what you want, preach what you want, and achieve the growth however you want. That's not a New Testament church. That's not what Kirby Woods is about. We see ourselves as an outpost of God's kingdom in Memphis, Tennessee. And our goal is simply to continue the work that Jesus has already started. All other ground is sinking sand, but we continue to stand firm and build our life and our church on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Pray with me.